one. You'll hear two friends planning an event. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello, Joan. I'm glad you could come. Hello, Peter. What's up? Is something the matter? No, no. Everything's fine. It sounded urgent on the phone. Did it? It's just that I've had this idea, and I wanted to see how soon we could get it off the ground. Well, don't keep me in suspense. You know they're planning to close down the local clinic. It was in the newspaper yesterday, but most people have actually known for some time. Well, I thought we should do something about it. What did you have in mind? I thought we could organise a charity event and donate the money to the clinic. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it will show the local council how we feel and that we mean business. That'll take quite a lot of organising. Why don't we just hold a protest outside the town hall? A protest would take just as much organisation as an event like this. Besides, I think fewer people would turn up. A village fair or something like that would attract more people and get money for the clinic. People are more generous when they're enjoying themselves. Okay, then. It sounds good to me. How do we start? First, we put our heads together and come up with a list of people who'll be willing to help and people who can provide us with some of the things we need. For example, we might need a caterer to provide refreshments, a rock band for entertainment, tents, and so on. Then. We do a lot of telephoning around and try to get everybody together at the same time in the same place. Sounds like a lot of work to me. But that's only the beginning. First things first, though. Let's decide now on who to get to the initial meeting and where and when to hold it. Fine. Well, the village hall would be the best place to have the meeting. It's not as big as the youth club, but it's warmer. There'll be no problem getting permission to use it, but I suppose it depends on how many people we invite. We don't want too many, otherwise the meeting will go on too long and nothing will get decided. But the village hall is a good idea. It's more official than having it in someone's living room. How many? Six or eight people to start with? Ten at the most? Okay. Now we have to decide on a suitable day and time. Suitable to everybody, I mean. A Saturday or Sunday would seem to be the best choice because people aren't at work on those days. But they may not like the idea of giving up a part of their weekend for a meeting. Unless we persuade them it's for a good cause, or that it's to their advantage, and that it'll all be a lot of fun. We'll provide refreshments, of course. What if some don't want to give up their weekend? Then we'll give them an alternative, say one evening in the week after everybody's finished work. We'll see which is the most acceptable to them. Then book the hall. I can do the refreshments for the meeting. I'll get Darren and Maggie to help me. I'm sure they'll be more than willing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So, what's next on the agenda? A list of who we want at the meeting. Yes, of course. Obviously, we want someone from the clinic. I think Dr Perkins would be best. He can tell us exactly what the financial situation is there. You know, 
how much money it takes to keep the place running, and how important it is for the community to have the clinic. The vicar too, he can rally lots of support, and Mr. Sims, our member of parliament, he is very busy. But I think I can persuade him to come, or get his wife to persuade him to come. I see her quite a lot socially. That's great. Two other people I have in mind are Freddie Smith, the journalist. Yes, well, he's the editor of the local paper now and might be useful. He might let us advertise for free, and he'll know how to go about getting leaflets and posters printed. That's another thing. We'll need volunteers to put leaflets through people's doors and stick up posters all over the place. We can decide that at the meeting. What about the other person? What other person? You said you had two people in mind: Freddie Smith and. Oh yes, Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates, do I know him? You must do. He owns Greatfields Farm. We need a large area to hold the fete. Right. So how many have we got then? Seven or eight? There's Doctor Perkins, Mister Sims, that journalist. Freddie Smith, you mean? Yes, him, and the vicar and Mister Gates, the farmer. That's only five. There's you and me. That's seven. That will do for now. Let's start making phone calls. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Starting at the beginning, you can see the on-off switch just beneath the two lights. Having turned the machine on, these lights now become very important. When the light on the left has gone out, you can begin making coffee, as it means the water is now hot enough. Next to that is the water level light. If this is illuminated, it means the machine does not have enough water. It is essential that you turn the machine off and add more water the moment this light comes on; otherwise, you could damage the heating element. Once you have checked that both the heater light and the water level light are off, make sure the filter holder—that's the part with the handle just under the control panel—is in place. Once you have your cups ready, it is time to press the coffee delivery switch. That's the button just above the filter holder, beside the boiler meter. Remember to take a quick look at the meter, as it tells you the exact temperature of the water. On both the left and right-hand side of the machine, on the same level as the filter holder, you can see the steam pipes used for heating milk. These steam taps need to be cleaned regularly to avoid blocking. And finally, if you do spill any coffee, don't worry. Just make sure that the drainage pipe at the bottom of the machine is leading into a sink or a suitable waste container. As with the steam taps, the drainage pipe needs regular cleaning. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. First and most importantly, I'll tell you where you should go from tomorrow for your lectures and classes. The Health Sciences Building is on the west side of the campus, opposite the library, beside the History Department. As you are probably aware, there are six modules to the course, which will take a year to complete. That's two modules each term. In the first module of this term, you will be looking at current laws with regard to health and safety in the workplace. Don't forget that as you progress through the course, you should be building your thesis. This will need to be completed by the end of the year. Coursework will also be credited to your final grade, but the most important part of the course is the thesis. Now the final thing I want to tell you, and again you should know this, is that there will be a number of guest speakers throughout your course. They will come from a number of different medical backgrounds, but they will all be giving you their views on the relevance of health sciences in their occupations. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about America in the 1960s. You have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. We begin our examination of America in the 1960s with the usual caution. There is no sense in trying to understand any decade without looking at what came before. Those of you who still have outstanding coursework on the 1950s would do well to complete it now, if for no other reason than it will help make sense of the next series of lectures. But we must press on, and I'd like to begin my talk about the 60s with a reference to one of those things that came before, the post-war baby boom. With the end of the Second World War in 1945, there began in the USA an era of perceived prosperity and security. In short, people started to feel that the world was a much better and safer place to bring up children. So, at the start of the 60s, all those children born in the baby boom, 70 million in the U.S. alone, were teenagers. As the 60s progressed, and as this large number of people approached adulthood, there was a noticeable shift in the balance of power and young people began to have a voice in ways that were not considered possible in the more conservative atmosphere of the preceding decade. Things were moving forward at a rapid pace. The literature of the time brought out all the taboos. Everything was covered, such as race in, for example, the book To Kill a Mockingbird, the role of women changed, and uh, equality for women, well, let's just say that once certain books were published, women were no longer going to be satisfied with their roles as devoted wives and mothers. Through literature alone, the whole fabric of society was challenged, and by the end of the 60s, 
things would never again be as they had pretty much been for the preceding 40 years. It was a decade of protest, civil rights protests, feminism, the rights of minorities, the Vietnam War. All these causes led to peaceful and not-so-peaceful protests on college campuses and elsewhere. People had been given freedom of speech and they were going to use it. The crime rate rose to nine times what it was in the 50s as respect for the old order faded away. But it was also a time of great development. In medicine, the 60s saw the first heart transplant. In technology and the space race, where we saw the first American in orbit and lasers being invented at the start of the decade, and the first man on the moon, and the first primitive internet at the end. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. None of this, good or bad, might have happened if things in 1962 had gone slightly differently. On October 16th, President John F. Kennedy met with his closest advisors at the White House. They had obtained photographic evidence showing that Cuba was building or installing nuclear weapons. It was widely believed that Cuba was preparing to fire these weapons at cities in the USA. Kennedy was faced with three choices. To try to resolve the crisis diplomatically by negotiating with Cuba and the Soviet Union. To take action to block the delivery of more weapons into Cuba. Or to attack Cuba, destroying their weapons. Believing that the first option would end in failure and that the third option would lead to war, it was the second option that Kennedy chose. In doing so, he succeeded in preventing the buildup of more missiles. The Soviet Union then withdrew the weapons from Cuba. Most historians agree that if Kennedy had acted differently, the episode would have led to a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Millions would have died, and the world would have been changed beyond recognition. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on seasonal affective disorder. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the past few years, a new condition has been identified and given a name, SAD, short for Seasonal Affective Disorder. This is now recognised as a distinct kind of clinical depression, where people become depressed at the onset of winter, accompanied by a craving for sweet things, causing weight gain. Each spring and summer would then bring on almost maniacal highs and feelings of boundless energy and happiness. Experiments to combat this depression showed that increased exposure to bright light in humans could suppress their production of a darkness-related hormone called melatonin. 
The light needed to induce this change was about 2,000 lux, or about four times brighter than ordinary household lighting. It was then calculated that if bright light could suppress melatonin secretion, then it might have other effects on the brain, including the reversal of symptoms of depression. While melatonin's precise role in SAD has not been pinned down, the theory led to effective treatment. Not surprisingly, SAD affects more people where winter nights are longer and days shorter. In the UK, an estimated half a million adults develop a full-blown SAD in winter and twice this number suffer the milder condition called sub-syndromal SAD. About 80% of sufferers improve when given light therapy and improvement usually comes within two to four days. Scientists are still unsure why winter depression happens but more than a decade of research has turned up some surprising findings. Nearly 80% of SAD victims are women. Researchers are uncertain why this is so. SAD can affect people at any age, but typically it begins around the age of 20 and becomes less common between 40 and 50. SAD is comparatively rare in children and adolescents, but so far researchers have been unable to come up with a logical reason for this. As many as half of sad sufferers have at least one family member with depressive illness, suggesting that the depression has a genetic component. Some patients experience shifts in their body clocks when they're depressed in winter. They are morning people at one time of the year and become evening people at another. What is the underlying difference between sad sufferers and others? A clue can be found in carbohydrate craving, a common symptom. People often become obsessed with chocolate, for example. Carbohydrates alter brain chemistry by increasing the level of a soothing chemical called serotonin, a neurotransmitter that carries signals between brain cells. Sad sufferers crave carbohydrates because they may need serotonin to lift their mood. This craving can be intense, in fact, an addiction. It may be that the serotonin system of the brain has problems regulating itself during the winter. Some sad sufferers respond well to the drug Prozac, thought to influence the brain's serotonin-using system. Other brain chemicals and hormones probably play a role in winter depression. Another neurotransmitter, dopamine, for example, may be inadequate in certain cases. Researchers hope to uncover clues to SAD secret by probing similarities between SAD and hibernation. Though no valid link between the two has been established, some SAD patients say they feel like hibernating animals. SAD sufferers tend to put on fat in autumn and early winter, roughly the time when such hibernators as bears and squirrels do. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.